Oh, Father God in heaven, Lord, thank you for the Holy Spirit, because Holy Spirit, I'm praying that you would be poured out in your house here this morning. We want to get into the word and we're looking at this whole idea of what does it mean to become a Christian and truly what does it mean and what does it take to become a follower of Jesus Christ. So I'm praying that you would open our hearts, our minds, and our ears to receive what you've shared with us in the word, these teachings of Jesus. And I'm asking once again that you would help me speak and teach me what to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know that 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 you're a Christian? Do you know that? Now, the reason I'm asking that question is because as your pastor, as your brother in Christ, I am invested in your relationship with Jesus, which is why I'm always going to ask, are you a Christian? Now, some of you might be looking at me and thinking, well, okay, Pastor Bob, how does anybody actually know they're a Christian? It's a really great question, and here's my response. Maybe I know you're a Christian the way I know somebody is a Jew. You see, if you're a Jew, you keep the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath. You follow the teachings of the Mishnah and the Torah. You try to keep some 613 commands as they are found in the Bible. And if you are an Orthodox Jew, you will wear black and you will never trim your beard. How do I know somebody's a Jew? Because they live like a Jew. It's, this way I, it's the same way I know if somebody's a Muslim. If they're a Muslim, you will, you will follow the teachings of the Quran. You will celebrate, celebrate Ramadan. You refrain from smoking, and you don't drink alcohol, and you don't eat pork, and you pray five times a day, and you'll either pray to the east or you will pray towards Mecca. Again, how do I know somebody's a Muslim? Because they live like a Muslim. Again, I want to ask you, are you a Christian? Here's what I know. I am a Christian. And maybe you're wondering, well, Bob, how do you know that you're a Christian? Well, it's the same way I know everything else in my life. For example, I know that I know how to ride a bike. Now, how do I know that I know how to ride a bike? Well, it's the three Ds, and they are, I made a decision, I became a disciple, and I can demonstrate it in my life. You see, one day I decided I wanted to ride a bike, but I didn't know how to ride a bike, so I found somebody to teach me the way of the bike. It sounds like karate, doesn't it? And uh, I became their disciple. And then after they taught me how to ride a bike, I was able to demonstrate it in my life. Now, let me tell you how it all began. One day, I was walking down the street, and my best friend at the time, Stephen Murray, come riding down the street, and he was riding a banana seat bicycle with high-rise handlebars. Anybody remember banana seat bicycles with high-rise handlebars? I loved those bikes. And so I'm watching my friend Stephen Murray ride a bike, and if Stephen was riding a bike, then Bobby Windsor had to ride a bike. So I went home and I said, Dad, I want to learn how to ride a bike. Will you please teach me? Now, there's two ways to teach somebody how to ride a bike. There's the long way and there's the short way. Now, if you're a parent, the long way will see you taking your child and you put them on a bike and you'll take hold of the handlebars and you'll take hold of the seat and you'll walk or you'll run along with your child and eventually when they're ready, you will release them and you will go, ride, ride, okay, you ride. The short way will see you putting your child on a bike, you will give them a push and they will live or die. <laughs> my dad preferred the short way. And under my dad's tutelage, I learned that there were several ways you could stop a bike. You could use the brakes, you could ride into the bushes, the back of a car, or you could fall off the bike. Believe me, all four work. But eventually I learned how to ride a bike and I could stop a bike properly. Well, the day came when eventually I had to demonstrate that I knew how to ride a bike. And so um, I, before my dad, I got in the yard, I could turn, I could brake, and then eventually dad said, Bob, you can go out and you can ride your bike with the rest of your friends. And I just didn't take up bike riding, but I took up jumping my bike. I jumped my bike off of anything I could find. First it started with the sidewalk, and then it would be a ramp, and then eventually in my neighborhood, 
My part of St. Uh, part of St. John's, there was a lady by the name of Mrs. Murphy who had a retaining wall. Oh, maybe it was about this high, maybe the height of your pew. And I told my friends that I could jump off that wall, and they said, oh, no, you couldn't. And I said, oh, challenge accepted. And so I took my bike. Now, if you've ever been to St. John's, Newfoundland, the entire city is built on a hill, and there are hills everywhere. And so I rode my bike up Anthony Avenue, and then I got ready to go. And I come barreling down Anthony Avenue. I cut across Mrs. Murphy's lawn, and I launched, uh, launched my bike off that retaining wall. And I tell you, I felt like evil Knievel himself. I mean, I had the front of the wheel up like this. I was flying through the air. I had hair. I had wind going through my hair because I had hair at the time. And my friends were going, oh, you know, way to go, Bob. Come on, Bobby, let's do this. And I was feeling great until I landed. And when I landed, that's when I turned my bicycle into a unicycle. <laughs> I picked myself up. I brushed myself off, and I'm looking at my bike, and I'm trying to figure out, I'm crying, because I'm trying to figure out how am I going to explain to my dad that I turned my $100 bicycle in the 70s into a unicycle. But please don't miss my point. I know that I know how to ride a bike. How do I know that? Because I made a decision, I became a disciple, and I can still demonstrate it in my life. But now here's the thing. The same is true of Christianity. You see, Christianity begins with the decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Now some of you, you've already made that decision. And some of you, well, you haven't made that decision yet. But please understand that Christianity begins with the decision to become a follower of Jesus. Jesus put it this way. And he said to all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, this morning, you know and the children know I love illustrations. And this morning, I asked Brandon if he would help me with this illustration. So, Brandon, would you please come up? Most of us, when we hear this word follow, this is what we imagine. Brandon, I'm going to ask you to stand right there and just stay right there for a second, okay? What we imagine is that I'm behind, and somebody goes ahead of me, and then I follow the person who's going ahead of me. And we look at them, and we go, well, if it's safe, and if it's okay, then maybe I'll follow behind you. But that word for follow in the scripture is actually made up of two words. And those two words are accompany and in union. In other words, you are doing what the other person does when you see them do it. Brandon, can we illustrate this? Okay, I'm going to ask you to stand out here where people can see you. Now, we want to be careful. I'm going to ask you to just face that wall, okay? And you're going to do exactly what I'm going to do. So let's just take a casual walk. You can walk with me. Let's just casually walk. Now, let's speed up. Can, let's speed up. Stop. Let's go backwards. Okay, let's turn around. Let's face that direction. Let's do a couple of squats. Why don't we do a couple of squats this morning? Okay, just to get the blood going in the body, right? Okay, but do you see what I mean? To follow means I'm going to do what Jesus does when I see him do it. Brandon, thank you so much for your help, young man. I really appreciate it. Do you understand? Follow does not mean they go ahead and I'm behind. It means I do what Jesus does as soon as I see him do it. Which is why we are told in Ephesians 5, chapter 1, therefore, be imitators of God. Now, if you're a note taker, you see that word for imitators in your Bible? Well, you could circle that word, and you could write beside it this one word, mimic. Mimic means I am copying another person. Mimic is what my son used to do to bug my daughter. Anybody here ever been on a long road trip with your kids and you're trapped in the car with them with no way of escape? Anybody here ever been in that situation? That's when my youngest will start bugging the oldest and I will hear, Dad, Justin's bothering me. Dad, Caitlin's bothering me. Dad, Justin's touching me. Dad, Caitlin's touching me. You're touching me. No, you're touching me. You're touching me. No, you're touching me. And then I would finally get fed up and I would say, knock it off. 
don't you two make me come back there. To which the youngest foolishly replied one day, hey, you two, don't make me come up there. <laughs> Six weeks after his recovery. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It was only two. <laughs> but do you get my point? Please don't miss it. God says, you are my kids, and it's okay for you to imitate me, because to imitate me means you're going to do exactly what you see Jesus doing. Now, so the first thing we do is we make the decision to become a follower of Jesus. But have you ever noticed that sometimes following Jesus can be a little hard? Have you ever noticed that God's got his will and his way, and we have our will and our way, and sometimes our will clashes with God's will? Well, what do you do when it's your will is clashing with God's will? Well, this is where you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you, do you know where, actually, I'm going to just back up a little. That word disciple comes from a word that we don't like to use anymore. In an age of prosperity gospels and new age religions and, and psychological gurus, this is a word we do not like to use. Anybody know what the word is? It's discipline. Now, when you hear the word discipline, what do you normally think of? What comes to mind when you hear the word discipline? Talk to me, folks. Pardon? Spankings? Corrections? When, when, I think, when I think of discipline, I think of my dad who had a belt and he knew how to use it. And whenever I got into trouble, my dad would whip off that belt and I would get it on the hands or I would get it on the butt or I would get it upside the head. When I think of discipline, I think of pain. Now, the reason here in Canada we've stopped that form of discipline is because so many people would use that form of discipline not as a form of, of discipline or, or education, but as a way to pay their kids back for upsetting me. Well, you made me angry, you got me upset, so now I'm going to make you pay. When the Bible talks about discipline, do you think that that's what it's talking about? That God is saying, you've upset me, now I'm going to make you pay. Do you think that's what it's talking about here in... Oh, I'm going to just kind of move beyond that just right now. Um, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. You see that word for discipline? It means to train, to educate, or to tutor, which is why Hebrews 12, 6 says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Now, some of us might be thinking, okay, but Pastor Bob, doesn't God just love me the way I am? And that's true. God does love you the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. Is there anybody here who's ever been chastised by the Lord? I tell you, it is not fun. Let me take you back to an earlier part of my life. It's a Saturday night, and I'm about to watch my favorite sin in the form of an action movie. Now, I love movies that go boom. I loved movies with hot cars and fast women. I know it used to be the other way around, but today it's kind of changed, hasn't it? And I'd be sitting there on a Saturday night, and I'd have my popcorn and my chicken wings and my root beer, and I'm about to watch this movie, and there's going to be explosions and car chases, and there's going to be action. And as I'm watching this movie, I'm getting into it, and something changes in my heart. And the moment that something changes in my heart, that's when the Holy Spirit comes up to me. And notice the Holy Spirit didn't come before I got into the movie or during the opening credits. No, the Holy Spirit is coming to me then the, when I'm right in the middle of enjoying this movie, that moment my heart changes. And the Holy Spirit comes up to me and taps me on the shoulder and says, um, Bob, you remember, you remember that pick up your cross and, and, and follow me thing? Well, Bob, right now I need you to pick up your cross and I need you to put this to death. And now there's a conflict between my will and my way and God's will and his way, and we're starting to do this. And so the Holy Spirit's not getting anywhere with me, so he sends the wife. 
Not the, hey, you lazy, good-for-nothing bum, what kind of Christian is watching this kind of stuff anyway? Not that wife. What he sends is the holy wife. This is when my wife would come downstairs and say, honey, you know, I see what you're watching on TV, and, you know, God and I, we won't be watching that with you tonight, so just know I'm going to go upstairs, and I'm going to be praying for you, and I love you. And I'm sitting there, and you see the situation I'm in? First, it's the Holy Spirit, and then it's the Holy Wife, and I'm like, holy mackerel. And I'm sitting there and going, please, can't I just catch a break? And God goes, no, you can't catch a break. Why? Because as much as I love you, Bob, the way you are, I love you too much to leave you that way. You see, God's plan for correction and discipline is not to hurt or harm you. God is not out to pay you back, but God wants to transform your life. Now, how do I know he wants to transform your life? Well, I want to go back just a couple of slides here. And uh, some people will come to me and say, but Bob, you know, doesn't the Bible just say God loves me and, and if I just believe, that's all I need to do is I just need to believe I really don't need to make any changes? And then they quote John 3.16. Can you read it with me, please? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, doesn't it just say, I mean, look at it right there. It says believes. Now, let me ask you something. Is that all that word means is that I just, I acknowledge it and I just know it in my head? You see that word for belief? It means to abide in, cling to, rely upon, and trust in. Now it's no longer a word that means I just know it. It's a word that says I am doing something about it. Which is why in James chapter 2, 19, you read, You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe, and they shudder. Now, let me ask you, does Satan believe the Bible is the inspired word of God? Yes. Absolutely. Does he believe that the Ten Commandments were written by the finger of Jesus Christ? Yes. Does he believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and that Jesus can save you from your sin? Yes. Does he believe that Jesus is coming again? Yes. Then based on that belief, we could baptize that sucker and let him give a testimony next week. It ought to be a whopper. So how is it that you're a Christian and Satan is not? Because you made the decision to follow Jesus and do as Jesus does. And when he gives you correction, you accept it. Amen. To be a Christian starts with, I've made a decision to follow Jesus. And then I'm going to learn what it means to become like Jesus. And then eventually that takes us to... I'm going to demonstrate this in my life. Here's what we're going. Now, here's how I know that. It's Luke 6 and 43. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. And then this from our scripture reading today. Jesus said, by their fruits, you shall know them. Now, in the church, we have all sorts of fruits. We got fruit cakes and fruit loops, and some of our brothers and sisters are bananas, while others are apples and oranges. That's not what this is talking about. What this is talking about is God reproducing his character in your life. And if you don't know what that looks like, then please go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse, 30, verse 22, because this is the picture of God's character that he wants to reproduce in your life. If you're a Christian, this is what I should see. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. God wants to reproduce in your life these attributes of his character. Now, let me ask you, of all those fruit, which one makes all the others possible? There's this one fruit that without it, the rest do not exist. Do you know which it is? It is love. Love is what makes everything in the religion of Jesus Christ work. If you're a Christian, you are going to live a life of love because all the other fruit follow it. 
Which is why Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love is the fruit by which I know you are a Christian. And if you are not living a life of love, you are not. You cannot be a Christian. Amen. Little Billy grew up in a neighborhood. It was poor. It was the kind of place where they didn't have community centers, swimming pools, or playgrounds. It had a school and it had a church. And it was a little community church. And every weekend, little Billy and his family would attend the church. Well, eventually, his dad received a raise, and they moved to an, a more affluent neighborhood, and they had community centers and swimming pools and, and, and all sorts of stuff for family recreation, and they also had some really great churches, you know, churches with inspiring worship services and great youth programs. And after two months of worshiping at one of these churches, little Billy would every weekend get on his bike and he would ride for kilometers across the city and go back to his old community church. And people would ask him, Billy, why in the world are you riding all the way across town when we have a perfectly good church and churches here in our neighborhood? And little Billy looked at them and he said, well, he said, it's because over there they really know how to love a brother. Amen. You see, here's how I know that you're a converted, born-again Christian. You're living a life of love. I know you're saved because you're a better spouse. You're a better parent. You're a better friend. You're a better coworker. You're a better neighbor because you're demonstrating in your life God's character of love. To be a Christian means that I make a decision to follow Jesus. I become a disciple, and then I demonstrate this in my life. Let me ask, are you a Christian? And some of you might be thinking here this morning, well, Pastor Bob, after hearing this, this message, I'm not so sure. And if that's the case, then I want to encourage you this morning to do these three things. Please, right now, here today, make the decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Then let God disciple you, to teach you, educate, and tutor you in what it means to become a follower of Jesus and to reproduce His character of love in your life so much so that you're walking in love. Because let me tell you, if you're walking in love, you won't have to tell people you're a Christian. They will know you're a Christian. For they will know we are Christians by our love. So today, I want to encourage you to make the decision, become a disciple, and demonstrate it in your life. And if you do, you'll know. You will know that you're a Christian. Amen.